But I suppose really it's been a chance to reflect. And I think that's the thing which has been desperately lacking um, for for a lot of kind of chefs or a lot of just generally hospitality. You know, you are constantly working at such a frenetic pace that you never have the chance to kind of sit down and go, what the fuck am I doing? And why am I doing it? And what matters? Hello everyone, welcome back to Breaking Bread, the Birmingham Food Podcast, presented by Food Obsessed Mates, Liam and Carl. I'm Liam. I am Carl. Hola. That's Carl. So we started this podcast because we think Birmingham is awesome. I mean, we've been banging about a great Birmingham news for years. It took me a little bit longer to catch up. It's only just got better and better. Yeah. Like it was good, and this just keeps getting better every time. I feel like you were just saying it for the sake of it years ago, and now it actually has fulfilled your prophecy. (laughs) You know what? The more I think about it, and I go back, like, there is a lot of better stuff now in Birmingham. I'm not going to say I prefer how it was, but there's areas of Birmingham that I prefer how it was. But either way, people never used to speak about how good Birmingham was. No. Although we had Michelin stars, people never really rec- truly recognised how good the Birmingham food scene was. Part of the reason the food scene so awesome is because of the people involved. So we wanted to introduce some of these people to you and get behind the scenes of how our amazing food scene. How you been, Carl? Yeah, buzzing. Well, say buzzing. Sick of it as well. Sick of this lockdown, man. Sick of it, but... This is the end. Maybe. Friend. Hopefully. Friday Hopefully. was a uh, was a gentle kick to the bollocks where I thought he was going to say, you know what, Monday's not happening. And yes. uh, I would have been absolutely devastated. So we're really happy to get hospitality back open, obviously. We think it's been wrongly scapegoated, but we'll get back into that. Uh, a few dates for your calendar coming up. 3rd of July is the awesome Burger Fest. We went there last year, well, no, two years ago now. And it was just, it was ridiculous, wasn't it? Yeah, it was crazy, really good. It's a shame it's the same day as Beer Central, though. Beer Central, same day, which is We're going to be Beer Central, which is genuinely the most fun day I had of 2019 now. So if you haven't got tickets for Beer Central, get tickets for Burger Fest. Yeah, either of it, or go one in the morning, (laughs) one in the afternoon. Either way, it's just really good to get talking about this kind of thing again and get talk about, getting excited about going out again, isn't it? That's it, man. The diary's filling up quick now. Mm. So today's episode, we see the return of Alex Claridge, uh, obviously chef owner of The Wilderness. I'm sure he doesn't need any introduction. Most people probably know who Alex is. Yeah. Alex, um, another great podcast. I like use a genuinely like user in for a treat with this podcast. It was probably one of the best ones I think we've done. Very insightful, showed in what someone's actually had to go through through the pandemic that owns a restaurant and what they've had to do and not just for his own restaurant, he's done quite a lot for Birmingham and the hospitality industry as a whole through the pandemic, including charitable work as well. Yeah, I mean, part of the reason why I aim to have Alex as our first guest on this brand new series season, who cares what it is, we just talk about great food, uh, is because of how much he's done during the pandemic. I mean, from back in March and the petition, and he's just been relentless, like trying to stand up for the industry. And I felt like he'd be a great person to have on the, the welcome back. No. Nah. Yeah. Alex probably be the first to admit, like, he's done stuff in the past that maybe he hasn't always been proud of or he's genuinely not not like that and I feel like to this episode now we, we really got to know him a lot more if you're going to listen to this episode we don't really go through the life story like we usually do we normally start off at the beginning how'd you get into food all that jazz. yeah we've done that before it's the advantage of the second episode you can yeah. just get straight into the nitty gritty and no backstory just what's the plan what's going on and get on with it it's more like a, just a chat that we, we generally have with with our mates and stuff and 
Yeah, so if you want to listen to all that, obviously definitely go back and have a listen to that first episode with Alex. And this one's not really about that. So I was listening to our, our first episode. And you know what? There were some times where I was so sad. Like, I felt like I wanted to reach in the speakers and give Alex a hug. Mm. And I was like, man, this dude's been so through so much. Like, And then this time, like we met him. He was relaxed. He was speaking quite positively about the future and everything that's going on. I felt like it did present to us a more mature, kind of optimistic um, look. And I was just really happy for him, to be honest. Yeah, I think it really comes across. I was really impressed with the conversations we were having. But as I said, if you want to go back and listen, make sure you go back and listen to the first episode, get a feel for him, and then come back and listen to this one. Give us some feedback about what you think. If you think you know Alex, I'd suggest you give this a real good listen and maybe it might surprise you. Yeah, and listen to all the other episodes because they're all brilliant. Yeah, all our episodes are brilliant. Yeah, And if you want to help us spread the word, we're on a mission to tell people how good Birmingham is and you can help us do that by subscribing on Apple or just following us on Spotify and then that way then you'll never miss our episodes. And the more downloads we get, the more it boosts the algorithm on an Apple Podcasts and on Spotify and the more people get to hear about this. So if you love Birmingham like we do, help us out. Help mm. spread the word. Tell friends about us. Yeah, man, it's free as well. Yeah, it doesn't it cost, cost you. Them. We're not we're asking you for charging anything. anything. We don't charge anyone. We don't ask for anything off anyone. No. All we ask for is your support. Time. That's all and we're asking for. It. Time yeah. off people to interview and time off people to listen. Yep. Yeah, so help us out. Yeah, hope you enjoy listening to this episode because we really enjoyed making the episode and, and go and book the wilderness. That, that's for all I can suggest. If you've never been there, it's If incredible. you haven't been in the wilderness yet, it's a very sort of different experience for yeah. fine dining. You'll hear about it more in the show. So have a listen and go book. Ladies and gentlemen, Alex Clary. Show. Really grateful to have you back. I hate saying show. Sounds so. Yeah, you don't need shit, to. Not show, is it? I don't you know. don't need to do that, it's really. It's show business, like. <laughs> it's not like the Carl and Liam show, or the Liam and Carl show. No, it sounds really If you renamed cool. it, going sort of like Saturday night entertainment um, vibes. Saturday, yeah, Breaking maybe, yeah. Um Well, thank you for having right. me back. Um, it's always a surprise to be invited back to anything a second time. So, <laughs> uh, delighted to have the opportunity to have a little catch up. It's been a hell of a year. You don't know. Yeah, I mean. I told you before we started that you were the most listened episode, so it seemed obvious to start off this new series with getting you back on. Right, yeah, give the people what they want. Exactly, it's not rocket science. <laughs> no pressure whatsoever. <laughs> nah, it's good. We relax, we chill. It's, it's good. Um, so you kind of said then what a hell of a year it's been. I listened to our last episode today. Just You shouldn't have done that. It was very nihilistic. It was brilliant. It was a very forgot dark how, place. I honestly forgot how <laughs> we still do get a lot of feedback. I mean, genuinely, we get a lot of feedback from that episode. People yeah, said how yeah. good it was. I mean, I don't well, that, that, that isn't exceptionally yeah. kind. Um, it, it's like, I, I, this is going to be really upbeat. We're going to talk about how excited we are about the wilderness and getting back to the wilderness. We're recording this one week before we everything reopens and this will be coming out on the day that everything reopens. Yeah, one week till floodgates open. At this time next week, people will be nude in public. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I do promise that this is going to be exciting and a, a really upbeat episode, but I feel like it'd be criminal if we don't start off with... We ended the last podcast, which we recorded in November 2019, with you saying, right, this is... It's been a crap year, but this is the year. <laughs> and... Great things are coming in 2020. Oh, Little how did we, we laugh. know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm making no such positive predictions now. Four months um, later, a bombshell came. No, I mean, you know, no one could have predicted um, what happened, I don't think. Um, and I mean, I, I'm not going to, you know, go on too much really about how difficult it's been for hospitality, I think, in, in every possible way uh, conceivable. Uh, a whole myriad of people across the sector have expressed that, yeah, it's it's been horrible. 
you know it's been it's been super difficult and i think it's changed this industry irreversibly and certainly some of those changes are negative some are positive and i kind of feel like the rest is is very much in the hands of of not just those who who work in the sector but but those who who enjoy it um but certainly i've had my fill of global pandemics um <laughs> I've had my RDA, I don't need any more. And I very much hope that that we can now begin what will be a really long, hard process of recovery. Um, I think there's a lot of excitement right now. There's kind of that, oh yeah, we're back, kind of, my voice yeah. did not sound great <laughs> at that octave. Um, there's a lot of that excitement, but you know, we remain incredibly cautious, certainly for the rest of 21. I think it's going to be a very, very hard year. Um, we're expecting the main goal for us is just sort of survival and consolidation till 2022 when hopefully particularly with the commonwealth games which fingers crossed will go ahead for the city mm -hmm. there is the opportunity then to to kind of start to move forward um but yeah, yeah it's been proper shit hasn't it yeah it's ridiculous i mean the obviously the way i put it is there have been some great netflix shows <laughs> and going from someone who doesn't get to spend Saturday night watching uh, a Netflix marathon to someone who does, you know, I get it. I get it. Like, you know, if I knew that Tiger King was available, would I have ever wanted to work in a service <laughs> environment? I can't be sure. Something in particular that really gets me about this COVID, obviously how annoying and shit is, but I feel like since the vaccines have come in, everyone's forgotten about how bad this all started. Like everyone's given like the government like a, uh, like a clean slate, say, oh, well, yeah, they might have been a bit iffy. They tried their best, but now they've brought in the vac If we just briefly go back to them first few days of that March last year, if you remember. Yeah, for sure. Because a lot of people, they've, they've forgotten about it. And no one's talking about the fact that it was an absolute shit show in the beginning. It, it wasn't like he just announced lockdown on the 23rd and that was it. It was all good. Everyone chilled at home and watched Netflix. That, yeah, that's not sure. what happened. Look, you know, I, I think... Um I think you're right. I think that um, government communications will always be designed to uh, distract. Mm -hmm. And I think in many ways this has been handled particularly badly. Um, I think it, for me it's a very complex, nuanced thing because, you know, I have inadvertently been quite heavily involved at times with some of the kind of political toings and throwings on this um, the petition back in March that you know, hit some crazy sort of six digit number of signatures. We set that up. Um, we did a video for Boeing Hospitality in December and actually we're just doing another video now for hospitality ahead of reopening. So it's been really frustrating because in many ways actually on a local level sort of, you know, Andy Street, who is the mayor of the Midlands, recently re-elected, um, you know, he's been very supportive and he's actually tried to engage. Um, but from a central government perspective, you know, I think, and I want to say on record, history should never turn around and say that hospitality was crippled by COVID because that's bollocks. Um, it never had to be this bad. It never had to be this way. There are countries in Europe who have really demonstrated what support looks like for a sector uh, and the contempt shown for hospitality, not just in the early days, you're right, when Boris didn't have the balls to close hospitality, but just told everyone not to go. Yeah, um, it, it was to be precise. It was a week before he actually locked down. He just announced, oh, we should stop going to hospitality venues." Yeah, and you know, I, I just think every step of the way, really, um, the word is contempt. You know, this sector is 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 barely viable, and every occasion they've had to really kind of step up and make a difference. You know, there are countries in Europe who have guaranteed significant percentages of revenue. And, and, you know, I, I think it's very important for me that anyone listening doesn't hear like, oh, he's not grateful for the support that has been offered, right? Now, you know, we've had furlough and we've had grants, but to put context on these things, all support offered has been totally insufficient. You know, it has been 10% of the actual cost of being closed. You know, furlough still costs money and has done throughout. The reopening grant, you know, depending on your business size, you're getting between 12 and 18 you know, the reopening cost for us is between 50 and 60. And that combined with no real long-term tax breaks or incentives for hospitality. You know, this is a government who have the communication skills of a toddler. Um, and 
have really kind of given lip service. It, it feels like it's been a very performative response for the sector. And that's not to deride elements of good, right? The world doesn't exist as kind of good or bad. But, you know, it really has been worse than ever had to be for the sector. And actually, what we're finding on reopening is they've managed to hide a lot of the consequences of Brexit under the guise of COVID. Because yeah. I'm telling you that the longer term problem for us isn't COVID, it's Brexit. You know, we cannot find chefs because a lot of the European chefs have gone home. You know, we have supplies, you know, we source internationally as well as locally. And these supplies are either going under a lot of shellfish supplies and specialist supplies who relied on Europe. They don't exist anymore. When it comes to cost of goods, they're all increasing. When it comes to quality of produce coming from the continent, the quality is decreasing because it gets held up at port. You know, Brexit has very conveniently sort of been something that's been at the moment kind of subsumed by um, this weird. Um, and we all know that Boris basically has a massive crush on Winston Churchill, but you know, in this weird sort of homage parody of post World War Two, you know, community spirit, a great deal has been hidden, a great deal of evils, and you know, it's very important for me that hospitality doesn't forget. Um, and that's not to say that I think any government would have smashed it. Yeah. I think there was always going to be challenge, but, you know, it's been spectacularly... Because that's how a lot of... Normally, the arguments I have on Twitter is how it gets dismissed is, oh, yeah, and Labour would have done so much better. And yeah, and say, look, well, you know, like we... Very dismissive. You know, the, the older I get, the more I do not really uh, buy into the tropes of... Uh, you know, kind of party political lines. I think there are good and bad in all subgroups, right? But I can only speak on my experience and the experience of those who've got to speak to in the sector. And, you know, it didn't have to be this bad, surely. Um, and I certainly don't think that the more tokenistic stuff has, has, has really, in a meaningful way, uh, paved the way for, for recovery. Um, those of us who are still here are here through either the good fortune to have our own resource to manage um, and usually a mixture of kind of a stubbornness, uh, a resilience and an unwillingness to to walk away. But, um, yeah, you know, I don't want the narrative to ever fall to, oh, they did some vaccinations, wasn't that good? Because it's just a such so much more complex than that. No, I've got a feeling that's in two years' time or by the time the next election comes around, it'll literally be, oh, do you remember they got all them vaccines for us? We all did all right. That That's literally, this will all be forgotten. I'm absolutely, it's already, the beginning of this has already been forgotten by most people. When you've done the petitioner stuff and mate, even the whole time, have you had anyone reach out from the government or civil servants or anyone? Or? Uh, outside of local, no. Yeah. No, 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 we, we haven't. But, um, you know, I mean, equally, like, I don't, I don't know, this is a controversial viewpoint, but at times I think we've been in danger of a sector of, of realising that we're not the only people struggling, you know? Um, it has been hard, but if you speak to anyone who works in arts or kind of freelance as a kind of creative or, you know, retail or any myriad of sectors, unless you're one of the golden sectors, you know, who happen to be like... February 2020 feels like a good time to start making PPE. Should we give it a go? Yeah. Unless that's you. Um, you know, everyone's had their, their shit to deal with. It does feel like hospitality's been hit ridiculously hard for the transmission rate for what they actually... They've done studies and they found the transmission rate in hospitality is actually very, very low. I mean, yeah. yeah stuff that was very, very high, they just were happy to keep that open and they were happy to open them first. Like Primark's open, yet you're not. Yeah, like, that's yeah, insane I mean, that, that, to that, me. That, 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 is a, that is a riddle, isn't it? Riddle me that. Um, I mean, certainly, none of us have seen any evidence that, that holds up. Um, I know Sasha Lord had a, a slightly curiously timed kind of final bash at bringing forward this, this reopening date. And, you know, the more that comes out, the more it's clear that the motivation wasn't really uh, data-led, I guess. Um, I, in that instance, why... Were they so keen to sort of... It almost feels like it was pinned on hospitality and drunk people and they're, they're the ones doing well, it. Well, you know what? Does it just fit the narrative I, that it was I, young I need people? to be clear. I, I'm neither a politician, uh, expert on contagious disease, or indeed an <laughs> economist. Uh, I suspect the motivation probably comes down to, to kind of money. 
um, you know, many things do these days, right? Um, and a kind of balance uh, and, and fear of perhaps shutting some sectors and, and not others. Um, I'm sure that in 10 years' time, GCSE history or whatever weird acronym accompanies that level of study will feature a textbook and um, instead of studying Nazi Germany, which I know I certainly did, I'm sure, you know, we're all of a similar age, you guys got to study a bit about about that. I'm sure it will be, um, you know, the great COVID balls up of, of 2020, 2021. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, I, I don't want to kind of shut it down, but I guess very much for me, my mindset is, look, you know, shit has happened. Um, and, and, and kind of, I'm very much trying to, to sort of look forward you know, I've made my peace with the fact that, you know, the impact of COVID will be felt for some time, yeah. for so many of us in so many different ways. Um, I'm more interested in, in kind of, well, where do we go from here? And what positivity can you kind of squeeze out of it, right? Because otherwise, you just can become super bitter. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I need to be clear, like I'm a grumpy bastard, <laughs> a very <laughs> great deal of the time. Um, but regardless uh, i'm not sure how how much pure grumpy bastard vibes will, will carry me really these days uh, what did you get up to during lockdown did you jump on the banana bread train or i mean i jumped on the i jumped on the every <laughs> single thing i could eat train um <laughs> no i mean i, th I think uh, i've carried on working in some capacity throughout um be that i did online cookery lessons for a little while um which were you know which were interesting were kind of a chance to to still interact in some way with with guests um it has obviously been lovely to have you know to have more time at home um you know rachel and i got a dog so i feel like that's a, a massive tick on the lockdown activities <laughs> yeah. had a breakdown got a dog um but I suppose really it's been a chance to reflect. And I think that's the thing which has been desperately lacking um, for for a lot of kind of chefs or a lot of just generally hospitality. You know, you are constantly working at such a frenetic pace that you never have the chance to kind of sit down and go, what the fuck am I doing? And why am I doing it? And what matters? And when it comes to, you know, certainly my cooking or, or you know, my approach to, to food, you kind of get in this process where you, you never have the space like the menu we're reopening with the development for that started in feb you know we've had months of living with with dishes myself and, and, and my head chef marius we've had literally months of being able to discuss well what's the point of this what's that ingredient mean where do you want to get the ingredient from like is there any point to cooking this at all um and i think it's made us a more thoughtful restaurant which I mean, proof will be in you know in the pudding, as they say. But I kind of feel like that's been invaluable, and it's been awesome having more time at home. You know, like I'm not gonna lie, I love you know the experience of dining out, and I love seeing the you know the the enjoyment that you can share with others, and all the things that we know make this job really great. But sometimes it's really fucking nice to not have to sacrifice every other area of your life for that, you know? And I think a lot of us realize now that, and maybe this is controversial, like we're all kind of sitting there going, we need to do better as an industry, not just for ourselves, but for the people who work for us. Um, you know, work with us, perhaps, is a nicer way of putting it. Because actually, these two polar opposites neither really work you know and there has to be and i think maybe the positivity is the industry is now under scrutiny in a way it's never been before you know conversations that have long been put to one side around work-life balance they cannot be ignored at this point um discussions around how the act of eating really fits into kind of community and everything like I feel like it's sort of made restaurants a hotbed of uh, difficult questions. And I don't have all the answers for those, to be absolutely clear. I have more questions than I have answers, but I think that's, that's kind of cool. Because everyone's been saying, you know, we've gone past the stage of, oh, you can just shout and be, be an asshole all the time. I mean, it, it, 
most of the time sometimes <laughs> it happens but you know that is no longer kind of on vogue you know i think we all know that ramsey has sort of created such a parody of himself a pastiche that that really that trope is gone you know people realize that that's not necessarily the best way to get results but after this much time to reflect on it you know it's it's, it's all these questions going to be like well what are we doing for the the you know the younger chefs and and you know bartenders and, and waiters who are working with us what are we doing to to make sure this is worth their while why would you come into this industry and like that's a really big question right now because a lot of young people have watched the industry for the last 12 months pretty much go oh you know we're fucked we're fucked we you know we're fucked we need help we need help like would you right now be like i know what feels like a safe industry for me would you jump in i'm not sure i would so I think the onus is put on those of us who are reopening to try and reopen better. And I don't just mean like better food. I mean better business, right? Like a better kind of more holistic way of looking at things. Um, so I think that's the thing which may take some time, may involve breaking a few eggs, but I think it's really important. I think has come out of this. What kind of practical, thi practical things will you implement? Um, well, any complaining will whip them. Uh, no, I mean, we started the start of lockdown. Some of the things we did at the very start of lockdown, um, you know, we put in place uh, a counsellor on retainer for all staff. Um, you know, I make no bones. You know, certainly over the last five years, I've had times where my mental health has been pretty poor, you know, pretty, pretty bad. And, um, you know, I recognise the power of having a professional to kind of reach out to. And it was amazing as we put this in place at the start of lockdown and, you know, we've had multiple members of staff just use it and it's anonymous like you don't have to come to us we're not trying to put obstacles we've gone look sometimes life's really hard and this job can make it kind of harder use it um we've been very religious in kind of check-ins which which i think has been super important because i think it's been very lonely for a lot of people um and we're, we're going to maintain that <sighs> And we're still kind of toying with, you know, how we try and get better with the work-life balance. But I think one of the really awkward contradictions, and I don't have the answer for this just yet, is for for you guys, for kind of people who love food and drink, the reality is that food and drink of a particular quality will entail that level of hours and sacrifice. And the only places I know who are making real headways on that tend to be kind of Nordic. And you're looking at prices that would make any same person's eyes water, right? Because you have to remember a hospitality shift is 14 to 16 hours. So within three days, we've done a full-time week for anybody else. And um, I think that's one of the hardest things to work out, you know? Like, what's the answer? Do you put the menu prices to a stage where actually you can have two teams? Because I'm not convinced that coming out of a pandemic with quite a lot of kind of peril anyway. I'm not convinced that the world's ready for that. But then as an operator, we're all sitting on very, very heavy debt from money we've had to invest for COVID, from the bounce back loan, if you've taken that from, you know, supplies we might have let you defer for a period of time. And I guess that kind of question about viability becomes really interesting. Like what's viability? Is it you've got enough money to trade another day? Or is it you've got enough money and resource to uh, act in a particular way with how you do business. Um, and as I said, I, I don't have the answer. I need to be very clear. I am not that smart. I do not have all the answers. A few years ago, mostly I just called people twats on TripAdvisor. I'm trying to be more eloquent, but this is very much a work in progress. Are you envisaging it being, you touched earlier that saying it was harder, it's gonna be harder because of Brexit to get stuff, but with the improving conditions that you're already hinting at, I mean, at the moment, no one gives a shit, mate. Like, or maybe we, we, we've had two chefs in the last uh, week let us know that for uh, primarily personal reasons, they're actually not going to come back. Uh, and our kitchen doesn't run without a full team. Uh, we've tried to interview, we've tried to offer jobs. And uh, uh, nah, mate, it's not happening, right? You know? Even the competition for restaurants trying to get chefs and waiting staff now surely that's going to get big as well between well them. you know UK hospitality has said that 25% of hospitality workers won't come back to the sector um, so you know it's super hard I mean my gut feel is it's going to be about taking 
probably taking on kind of staff much earlier in their career and accepting that the investment will need to be made in really nurturing and developing those people. You know, we've always been, because we're quite a small team, so we don't have loads of space for training and because we operate to a standard where not in an RC way, like, you know, it is not okay to make a mistake in, in my kitchen during service. You know, it will not leave the pass. We will keep going until it's right. Otherwise it doesn't leave. Um, so we always tended to hire slightly more senior staff at a particular level. Um, but my gut is maybe that's something we're going to have to reassess. We felt a bit like you had to do that because as much as like we believe, like we paint sometimes a picture that it, like this is so wonderful, this world of uh, restaurants, but sometimes customers are assholes. <laughs> so sometimes you will get the customer who will just be like, it, they won't tolerate and they will be horrible because... No, nah, I mean, I don't give a shit it. about that. Like at the end of the day... Um, you know, as I said, you know, I kind of regret when I was younger and I didn't really have the um, maturity, eloquence to kind of do anything and then just sort of lash out. Like, you know, you can't please everybody. Um, we have an amazing guest pool. Um, I don't know how much of that is luck, how much of that is design, um, because I was so horrible over the years. But, you know, we have amazing guests and we really do. We have very few um, who I would describe as massive pricks. Um, and I kind of feel like over lockdown, I have seen quite a lot of restaurants. Everyone's in distress, I get it. But I've seen a lot of restaurants at times lashing out at guests and kind of really going for them. And um, that's just not the place I'm in. You know, like if it's not for you, I'm kind of like, I'd rather kill you with kindness than, than anything else because um, you can't win, right? Particularly Twitter, like every fucking person on Twitter has an opinion or is offended by this or isn't offended by this or hates this person. Like, you know, I used to be a lot more active on Twitter, but I can't go on it just because the level of pettiness and stupidity on that platform is fucking deafening. And I think it makes me more stupid sometimes reading through my timeline. Um, you know, if any of our guests want to talk to us, we're a very open uh, bunch. You know, I don't shy away from it. Like, if you're not happy, then I'm not happy. Um, but no, it, it doesn't stem from like some sort of weird uh, servitude where I'm like, oh no, master, please. Like, I don't give a fuck about that. Like, I don't, the standard I hold, what we do too, isn't, not a rude way. It's not the standard I think my guests expect. It's, it's the standard that... You expect. Yeah, yeah, right? You know, like the older I get, the more I struggle. Like, I have a very particular way of seeing things and it's either right or it's wrong. And if it's wrong, um, it feels like a real, a very visceral physical tension for me. Um, so it's, yeah, it's, it's entirely kind of self-policing. Um, like there's some detail I'm sure I stress about that someone just eating a meal with us wouldn't care about, right? You know, and it's the thing I'm trying to work on. I'm trying to be less uptight um, because as I say, when I get up tight, I eat carbs, my hair starts to go gray, I become more peculiar. Like I'm trying to shut that stuff down. But um, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's not our guests. Our guests have been awesome. You know, the support of them through lockdown has been impeccable. I can't knock it. So not only is um, the wellness back open, but you're back open now. You've got not one drinks expert, but two of Birmingham's finest drinks experts. Yeah, but I won't get one free. Well, I think it's just kind of logically working through what we wanted to do. And in a really weird way, um, I kind of feel like both were inevitable. I mean... Sonal f feels like he was always part of the world. And that's like, and it's strange for somebody well, who's worked I, so long. I, at the I think it was a big fucking change for him. Yeah. Um, you know, like... I've got a lot, a lot of love for Glenn. He's got a very good beard. Um, he's very kind of a lockdown. Like he, he gave me, you know, a copy of his cookbook and he helped out with some of the campaigns. Um, but we're very different. Your um, restaurants are very different. Lots of yeah, yeah you know, for sure. You know, I've got a lot of respect for everything Bunnells have achieved. And I don't know if we could do what we do if they hadn't laid the groundwork. Um, but we're definitely more renegade um, and a little bit, I don't use the word weirder, but let's be honest, we're all thinking it. Um, so I think that was the case. And, you know, someone's had a really weird journey with us because he, he kind of joined and then the world fell apart. Um, so I think it's, it's, you know, it's been nice of a lockdown getting to, to kind of know him in a more meaningful way, perhaps outside of service. 
Um, but you're right, you know, I think it was inevitable as much as Sonal has nothing about him but kind of an earnest and sort of almost gleeful love of, um, you know, of a good time, right? Like that is just Sonal epitomized. He's, he's here for a good time. And um, I think with the wine menu, certainly where we're opening with, we've encouraged encouraged that in spades. We've kind of been like, look, you know, what's what wines have you always wanted to have on a list, but, you know, you've never had them on before because you weren't sure they were going to sell. Let's just fucking get them. If they don't sell at the end of the year, we'll get absolutely pissed. Um, <laughs> which might be great business, but like, it's a good way to live. Um, and then Rob, we worked with, he was the first bartender I worked with in the city and a lot of my thoughts about uh, drinks creatively, he he was a massive influence on me. Um, and we were also the first restaurant I think he engaged with, and I don't want to speak for him, but I like to think that in, in, in a small way, we were kind of formative vice versa. I kind of said to you guys before, you know, we both went our own ways and did our own projects. And in many ways, they were projects kind of born out of the same lineage. Um, and yeah, at the start of lockdown, things just kind of converged. And um, I think we missed working together and Rob is just exceptional at what he does with creating drinks and both him and I are of the belief that he should be doing more of that and less of stressing about some of the more mundane elements of running a business um, which are, unfortunately I accept uh, you know my cross to bear um, and uh, no it's been amazing you know like getting getting him back in the family and um I really like actually that we have a certain maturity, also super immaturity in a different way, but we have a certain maturity in our drinks team. You know, we literally have decades of drinks experience, which, um, you know, we want to be able to serve really esoteric or really interesting things. And the, the world of experience knowledge there gives us, you know, such a broad access to knowledge. And that's all we want. You know, we want to make sure that our drinks program, you know, has something for everyone and hopefully has something that will surprise everyone too. Well, that's it. When I've eaten at the wilderness in the past, the food's been fantastic, obviously, but then the drinks was as well. Normally, you get the drinks pairing or whatever, and it's usually okay or it's good, but you seem to have a different look on it that most people haven't really still copied onto yet, where you have cocktails and you have a mead or you have this or you have something completely different instead of just wine after wine after wine. Yeah, yeah for sure. I mean, it's, it's all just flavour, right? Like... I don't give a shit about the categorization. It's it's flavor, which is really no different from food. It's just we have texture to work with and they don't. Um, and that's always been our approach. Like flavor's flavor. Um, it sounds like a like a nineteen eighties <laughs> rap record, <laughs> which I would love to drop. I like what you said about maturity. It reminds me of Carl's dad always says, um, you, you haven't lived enough to like whiskey. <laughs> that's what your dad always says. Yeah, like. when we used to didn't like it. No, I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd made that if you haven't suffered enough to like whiskey. <laughs> yes. um, no, you know, the, look, you know, there's some incredibly talented young people who, you know, they have their shit together and they, they know, you know, they know everything. It's not about, um, yeah, deriding anybody in that. I just, I, I feel very fortunate to have, you know, two guys who've really served some time in the industry, have seen a lot and it means that when we discuss what we want to do, I kind of feel like we have a broad range of experiences and you know, there's a lot coming up with our drinks program over the next six months, all sorts. And I kind of feel like that's what happens when you bring together, um, you know, people have gone off and done their own thing and then come together to try and do, do something collectively. Can you see a big difference in Rob since you worked with him years ago and now? Like I don't know, man. Like, Rob's always Rob. He's timeless. I'm pretty sure that even on my deathbed, Rob will turn up and look exactly the same and just be like, do you want to know about sake? <laughs> I'm like, not now, Rob, please. Um, no. Uh, I mean, I think everyone's just kind of melded together, which is no mean feat, right? Because um, we haven't really been working full time. You know, like the guys have been either on furlough or flexible furlough and that's it. But we've tried to do kind of regular calls and, you know, sending each other things to read and discuss and all sorts. Um, and I'm super happy with kind of how everyone's sort of synthesizing each other's ideas. Um, and I think some of Rob's creations that I have got a chance to, have, to try over lockdown, like 
I personally feel like there's another level up on its way, um, which I hope is just a product of kind of going, look, you know, there's no such thing as a bad idea. Just try it. Like, just try it and we'll talk about it and we'll, we'll find something great in that and hopefully make it greater. Um, you know, so this, yeah, with that being too caged, like, there's some really, really fucking cool stuff coming from Rob later this year and like all credit to Rob and his talent. We've just been kind of like an Argent provocateur, kind of prodding him going, have you thought about this, you talented bastard? <laughs> um, but yeah, some amazing things coming. Have you found you've had a lot more time? Well, obviously you've had a lot more time, but has, that any, has any of that energy been pushed towards dish development? Have you tried stuff that you probably never would have tried without this time period off? I mean, I never thought I'd have a pizza for breakfast three days in a row, mate. So, yeah, it's, it's been wild. Um, I think it's been more just having the time to... Because normally, right, if, we, if the restaurant's open, we tend to have to develop that dish in spite of service, you know? Um, a lot of development anyway, like credit where credit's due, it's my head chef. Like, we'll sit down and we'll talk through ideas and I'll talk through sort of where my head's at on, you know, particular flavor combinations or ideas or concepts. But, you know, I've been very busy just watching our cash flow burn um, while screaming into a void. Um, you know, uh, a lot of development is always with the team. Um, but when you're trying to do that in the midst of service, right, you'll kind of be like, do you think it's good? And you'll be like, well, I've got half an hour to get it on the menu, right? <laughs> That's not necessarily the sweet spot. Whilst now we've had the chance to make something and go, in four weeks' time, let's taste it again and see what we think. Um, and we've also thought a lot more about just this taste menu format, right? Because that's always the debate. Like, you know, generally speaking, like a certain percent of people hear the words taste menu and think, well, you're a prick. Now, for a restaurant of our size, it's kind of a, a necessity. Like, we just, for us to deliver the quality we want, like, believe me, if I could do like a two and a three course a la carte and we could be more accessible in that way I'd fucking love it but you know would I, you do like could you I, tell because you said before you use food to tell a story you can't really get the story well, just, just sure, like the, the more you know like the, the brief occasions that like um, you know we've been able to eat out like when the world's been open like the last thing in the world I want to eat is tasting menu food I want like steak and chips right like or oysters that's what I want so I totally get the appeal I totally get people perhaps in a way I didn't used to people going nah I don't really want to spend two and a half hours like, I totally get it now for us because we're an 18 cover venue under COVID restrictions like I'd love to kind of offer that flexibility but you know I'd be busting a week you know we, we're we very limited, I guess, by we have a quality we want to achieve, we have a certain number of seats, and we have, you know, seven chefs at all times. Um, there's some real practical limitation there. Um, but instead, we've kind of really thought about how a tasting menu should flow. And I guess that's a big difference for us, you know, looking at it more of an album where you have to think about, you know, not all songs can be loud, not all songs can be quiet, some short, some long, some maybe sexy, some maybe kind of funky. Um, that, that went really south pretty fast but <laughs> like that kind of transition between courses and really thinking about the se sequence that's been a big kind of thread for us this this time around and um i'm hoping it'll make for a much more cohesive overall menu which is surely the goal right for a tasting menu it should be the courses are greater when they're eaten together in succession than they are individually yeah definitely. Like that's the goal um you know i'll let people who who eat with us kind of tell us whether they've achieved that but um, you know I, I think it's just given us a much more considered approach to creating dishes um, which for me is only a good thing you know I'm, I'm super excited I think it's the best menu that we've ever done and you know we've had some pretty good menus we've had some pretty good dishes but um, the amount of kind of love care and reflection that, that's gone in this time from both myself and, and, and Marius you know it's a first for us. Um, so I'm kind of this weird mix of nervous and excited and um, hungry, <laughs> which is my constant state, but to kind of <laughs> unleash that, you know? Yeah. Did you have a favorite dish on the new menu? Um, <sighs> to eat or like conceptually? I mean, conceptually, I, I, 
I fucking love like where we've gone some dessert. So like we have a, we have a transition course. So the idea is we wanted to have a course that was not quite dessert, not quite savory, but just kind of acknowledge the fact that we're we're kind of we're putting the brakes on your palate and taking you somewhere new. Um, so that just called ch ch changes because um, because I still love Bowie. Uh, so that's kind of like a Madras curry powder, white chocolate, um, tamarind pineapple rum encased in uh, what looks like a banana wow. um, so I really love that one um, but then we also have a, another course that's um, like a, a wagyu short rib uh, finished on a barbecue with a mother glaze with uh, a bone marrow curry oh. um, or kind of curry like you know not pretending it's authentic but you know just using really good spices and our version of that and um yeah, you could feed that shit to me with like a loaf of bread whilst I lay down, like strapped down, and I'd be, I'd be so into that. Um, How much input do all the kitchen have, or is it just you and Marius? Um, I mean, probably the wrong time to ask you when our kitchen's been furloughed for nearly yeah, all the year. Sorry, yeah. This menu has very much been a, a Marius and, um, and myself kind of working on it. Um, and it's been nice. We've probably had the best back and forth, the most opportunity to do that, you know, to kind of taste and go, oh, what about this? What do you think about this? Should we try this? Did it bring back a new excitement? Because obviously you worked with Stu for so long, so now you've got Marius just come in. Honestly, working my way through all these chefs. <laughs> Absolute <laughs> whore. Um, I mean, the excitement never kind of went went away. I think um, I think it's just different, right? Like every chef works differently. I think Marius and me have kind of, we, we've got a good thing going on. We found a kind of equilibrium between us that, that works for both of us. Um, so I very much enjoyed that. You're unique in pushing people to kind of explore where they want to go with their food. Uh, not worry too much about the cost and the, the, the ingredients. Just use your imagination. I mean, that's out the fucking window now. Like, if he can't get it on the Aldi <laughs> 5 for a pound veggie deal, he's not getting it, you know. Um, Has it took you long with Marius to kind of push him to that? Because a lot of chefs will come in and, and they'll want to do this dishes that they might have done somewhere else they've got their favorites so they're going to play it very safe and that's not you this is that's not the wilderness no i mean you know we we're finishing school for weirdos man like that's all it's ever been you know we've we've had as you know we've had a wealth of talent through our kitchen you know some of the best talent in the city has come through our doors like you know poppy who was you know uh, a chef de party junior sue for me like she's now a massive tiktok sensation doing wild things with potatoes you know like our team are always square pegs who don't really fit in round holes. And um, I just think it's fucking great. They're going to do cool stuff. Um, all we ever do is we set the tone. We set the tone. And, you know, when it comes to our, our food, you know, I have a particular way of looking at food. And all you can do is kind of take the horse to water and be like, this is kind of how I see food. Like, I'd really love to see what you do with, you know, with this style. Go nuts. Um, and has Marius coped with that? Oh, he loves it. You know, yeah. I mean... All chefs disagree sometimes, yeah. you know, like all chefs will disagree sometimes and that's healthy and that's natural. Um, I guess the real sweet spot is working out how to really disagree with each other in a way where it's productive. Um, but I guess lockdown's been good. You know, we've had all sorts of back and forth. Like, you know, but he takes the piss out of me. Like I've been trying to get white chocolate and uh, Madras curry powder <laughs> on the menu for a very, very fucking long time because I really believe in it as an interesting flavor combination. He finally caved on that. I need to go and try that. Um, <laughs> both at home. First but then, like, you know, he, 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 you know, he's very, very scientific in mind. You know, he's got quite an academic background in kind of biochemistry. So he'll try and ferment every fucking thing in the building. Like, you'll come and be like, where's the phone? And it's there fermenting, <laughs> right? He's trying to make a koji <laughs> telephone. Um, but you get to know each other's quotes, you get to know what excites each other, and you kind of work it through. And, and so it should be. Um, so it's always been the majority of time for us and anyone that we've, you know, we've chosen to appoint as head chef for, for the wilderness. Um, but no, you know, I've had a good, I've had a good time, man. We spoke quite heavily on the last podcast about uh, the wilderness was moving. Well, yeah. What I didn't know is the answer was to hell. <laughs> um, yeah, no, fuck knows. God knows, you know, we were, you know, we were working on, um, we were working on some cheeky little plans, but um, we are... Crazy uh, to move at the minute, though, right? Yeah, right, like, you know, just... Obviously, I hate myself, but I don't hate myself that much. <laughs> um, look, you know, I, I think there's a constant push and pull here. 
um, like the jewelry quarter site we have. There's loads of things I love about it, and there's loads of things I fucking hate about it. Right? Like I hate the communal corridor. I'm really sorry. I know it looks like the sign of a 1960s detective drama where someone's been killed. I understand <laughs> that. Um, you know, and I wish we had more space. I want a proper entrance bar. I know our toilets are a little bit shit, but you know. Also, this is a 200-year-old building, and as someone who at times slept in the restaurant over lockdown, it's fucking haunted, dude. Like, I'm not messing with you. <laughs> there are spirits in there. You know, it's very hard to find that in a new build. If you're like, oh, do you have anything with any malevolent ghosts? <laughs> they don't have them. Um, so I, I'm always torn. Like, I love the history of it, but there's definitely practical things I'd change. Um, and I mean, you know, we, we have been, we are still in talks about some, some interesting plans going into 22, but I just have this kind of really conflicted view over, would we still be the wilderness if we were somewhere that was, uh, more clean cut? Like, would it add, would it detract? It would be different, right? Um, so I don't have the answers to that. So uh, given the, the crippling financial circumstances we're emerging from, it seems like an okay time to kind of just keep asking the questions, you know, keep having interesting discussions. You know, we're always open um, to, you know, to a madcap plan. Um, but, you know, slow and steady seems the, uh, the right course of action now. Personally, I could... I love that restaurant. Like, I love where it is and how small. Well, I've got good news for you. I'll sell it to you for five pounds and a kiss. <laughs> Unfortunately, though, well, fortunately for me, I don't have to work in the that kitchen because it's tiny. It is small. No, I actually quite like the entrance. How you get into it, it reminds me a lot. I've been in Japan because everything's impossible to find there. You it there, it doesn't exactly like, feel I mean, like have, the best endorsement. Right <laughs> it's the right place, but then you get there, and then you're like, oh. Did it, no, I like it. It's a bit quirky. Yeah. I mean, we're, 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 we're doing a few little bits right now. We're making a few changes to, um, uh, I guess, to kind of align a little bit more the brand with the venue. Um, but yeah, you know, the, time's the trick. And, and, you know, now is not the time to uh, to make your life any harder than you possibly need to. It's very much focusing on the now rather than the distant future. Yeah, well, look, you know, all, all through this, kind of our mantra has been like, you know, we are short-term fucking terrified. We are medium-term pragmatic. And, and we're long-term optimistic. And, and that hasn't changed. You know, I live my life in constant fucking terror. Um, and at some point, I'll move to kind of mild terror, but a bit pragmatic about the choices we make. <laughs> um, and then hopefully we'll move to the kind of stage of... Um, you know, a little bit more chill, uh, a little bit more optimistic. But, um, you know, simply put, like, I, I've given far too much of what few sanity I had into this business. Um, and, you know, whatever else, you know, I love dearly our team, I love dearly our guests. And um, I can't think of anything worse than than losing. Well, I can actually shave my beard off. I did that once during lockdown. That was worse than losing a restaurant. I haven't got a chin. <laughs> There's your exclusive. We've got, we've got loads. Like, but Birmingham Live wanted it, <laughs> but I can confirm to you now, I don't have a chin. Today, Under this beard, I'm entirely just a, a kind of a vacuous void of man. I will send that quote, yeah. We'll send it over to Birmingham Live. They can put that off. You let them know. God knows what they'll <laughs> twist and turn. <laughs> yeah, we finished the last podcast and you probably don't remember, but you. I want to quote this because it's quite important. But you said... You've got a handwritten note. I'll write everything Wrote handwritten. If this feels either very heartfelt or like it's going to make me very oh, awkward. Handwritten notes of a quote. So you said in the last part that you... Oh, yeah. So you said you finished 2019 truly knowing yourself and what matters to you and who you truly are. <laughs> Has that... How do you feel now at the, at the kind of end of, say, 2020, start 2021? And do you think that helped with everything that's gone on in the last 15 months? Um, I mean, I kind of feel like it's just been an ongoing journey. I think all those things remain truer now than they were then. Maybe there's a contradiction in that. Maybe there's kind of a, just when you think you're making some progress, you realize you're still an inseparable asshole. Um, but no, like, you know, I, I, look, you know, professionally it's been brutal, but um, I am a happier 
kind of more settled human being and I'm excited to kind of see how probably for the first time in like my entire adult life where you know all sarcasm and sort of nihilism aside like I'm, I'm kind of happy right and yeah, you, you seem just like completely di- I don't know about you, yeah, but l- last time you were like well last time I was wearing trousers you seem like a different man very relaxed very yeah well it's, it's this great like, you can't get much more relaxed yeah. It's nice though, it makes me happy. Like, I feel like. Don't happy. tell them all I'm on a chaise long with nothing but a fig leaf. It'll make the podcast weird to listen back to. Um, I just feel like there's a happy ending here. Like, it's. I assure you weird. now, like, <laughs> there is no happy ending, Kieran. I need you to get out. If that's where you think this is going. <laughs> honestly, two against one. That's hardly fair, lads. Um, no, look, you know, um, to pull it back from a horrible innuendo and terrible smut. Um, yeah, you know, like. Uh, I think I've always created from a place of kind of uh, probably frustration and um, escapism. And and although COVID has been really, really shit, um, I kind of feel like I'm creating from a slightly new place um, with a team that, you know, we've stood by us. They've stood by. That wasn't the best (laughs) English I've ever said. We've stood by them and they've stood by us. Um, you know, and I, yes, I'm fucking terrified. Yes, like full disclosure, we owe so much money that, like, honestly, my knees are going to be so sore by the time we reopened. Um, but it's kind of it's a new territory for me, and, and you know, I've got to be honest, I'm kind of into it. Cool. It doesn't mean I'm going to stop being offensive though. So <laughs> if you think that, you can fuck right off. <laughs> I think there's loads to be excited about with the wilderness. Um, Thanks, man. Appreciate it. I can't that. wait to get back there. And honestly, jokes aside, it does make us very happy to see you all happy and relaxed. And yeah. Oh, God. Exciting times are coming. And Honestly, open- don't. Don't. People didn't tune into this expecting it to be all like <laughs> gentle nice. and lovely. <laughs> yes, yeah, so all I can say is best of luck. And yeah. I really hope it works out. Well, thanks, guys. I really yeah. appreciate that. And uh, I look forward to feeding you soon. And I mean, the happy ending, I need to be very clear. <laughs> There will be no happy ending. There will be no happy ending, <laughs> but, um, you know, other than that, it'd be a pleasure to kind of get back to, you know, to, to seeing people again, feeding them and, you know, doing what we can to, to make the city as ever, uh, you know, a more interesting place to be. Cool. We should pretend we're professional now and say, like, bookings and stuff are open. And uh, yeah, like, if you, you know, other reservations are available elsewhere, but... Um, you know, if you've been before and uh, would like to do that again, or if you haven't been before um, and you want to come, yeah, go to our website, wearethewilderness.co.uk. Um, reservations are open for the rest of the year. Uh, we are only a small wee restaurant, so please do book early. And um, I'm desperate, so often. <laughs> Perfect. Awesome. Thanks for coming on. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Cheers, guys.